Now, from my experience, making changes to the DTB is almost like an art. It's not like Ubu and the Linux kernel configurations. It can be pretty delicate and you really need to know what you're doing. By making edits to this file, you're essentially telling various source code and drivers throughout Ubu and the Linux kernel to configure the specific hardware in the Zinc chip and on your board in a very specific way. Most of the time when you need to go in and edit your DTB, it's probably because you're making your own PCB, but it could also be because you want to initialize some digital logic that you made in the PL. For starters, you wouldn't want to make changes to the DTB directly since it's a binary file. You'd instead make changes to the DTS or device tree source. The program that converts the DTS to the DTB is called a device tree compiler or DTC for short. If we open up the Linux kernel source code directory and go to scripts, DTC, you'll see the DTC program here. I'm going to copy this path since we'll need to reference the DTC later. Let's make our way to the DTS I'm using in the Zybo board in arc, arm, boot, DTS. The Zinc Zybo Z7.DTB is what we're using on the Zybo board. And the source for that is Zinc Zybo Z7.DTS. Let's take a peek inside and see what it looks like. So not too long, right? That's mostly because there are a couple of include files here at the top that abstracts a lot of the source code away from you. Instead of finding these files somewhere in the Linux directory, we can just reverse compile the DTB into a DTS file. You can do that by using the DTC program I showed you earlier in the scripts directory. It would look something like this. This is saying execute the DTC with a DTB as an input and a DTS as an output. And the name of that output DTS file will be zzz.dts, just so we can find it easier in the file manager. And the DTB file that we want to reverse compile is zinc zybo z7.dtb. Let's push enter. And now when we go back, we can see that there is a zzz.dts file. When we open it, we can see this is much longer than the other DTS file since this is a single file now that contains everything that was inside the DTB. To me, this is a lot easier to edit than bouncing around in different files trying to find what you're looking for. It's also nice knowing how to reverse compile the DTB in cases where you may not have access to the original DTS that made it. Let's take a look at a random location in this file. These blocks of code are called nodes. This node here tells me that there is some PMU device, which stands for Power Management Unit, that physically exists somewhere in the system, and to access it, the software, whether that be in Uboot or the Linux kernel, or both, need to write and read from physical address of hex F8891000. I also know that by looking at this, that the interrupts associated with the PMU are coming in at the pins on the Zinc chip marked at these hex values. If you don't understand what any of that means, don't worry about it. You shouldn't really need to modify anything in the DTB for this board anyway, since it's already been done for you. But for more advanced embedded developers out there, or for those who are just curious and want to learn more, I'll put a link about the device tree usage in the description. All right, so let's say that you've made your edits in the DTS. To compile your DTS to a DTB, it's almost the same command, but instead the input would be a DTS and the output would be a DTB. You'd also change the name of the output file you're creating to be a .DTB file type, and lastly, the DTS file you want compiled. And here's our compiled DTB file. And just to make sure reverse compiling and normal compiling give you the same output, take a look at the size of the DTB that we just created. We see that it's 11.2 kilobytes. We would expect the other DTB file to be the same size since we didn't actually change anything. And it looks like it is. But let's take it a step further and just make sure that it's 100% the same as the old DTB. Let's do a diff in the command line just to compare the two files. And diff returns nothing, which is exactly what you'd expect to see if the files are a perfect match.